The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14183 in the name of John Finney on the postcode penalty. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would further invite those members of, a, of the Parliament who are leaving uh, to do so quickly and quietly, and also include in that invitation to leave quickly and quietly members of the public. I now call on John Finney. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I also too would like to thank the members who have signed this motion and to congratulate Citizens Advice Scotland on a very fine report, the postcode penalty, the distance travelled, uh, and the author, authors David Moyes and Kate Morrison. This is the latest in our long-running campaign, starting in 2010, involving Sky and La Half, Citizens Advice Bureau as then was, with a further report in 2012 from Sarah Beatty Smith, who many of us will know. Um, high delivery surcharges for consumers in remote and rural areas the problem of that has not gone away. Is that better, President Officer? Beg your pardon. Um, and um, businesses have, have been affected too. 15,000 businesses in remote and rural areas are at a competitive disadvantage because of this. And that on top of the geography, connectivity and fuel disadvantages that already exist. Um, so the report outlines that uh, these problems continue to impact on the Scottish and Highlands and, and Islands. Uh, and uh, that mere term Highlands and Islands, it seems, can be extended as far south as Stonehaven, Perth and Helensborough. Uh, wonderful locations, though they are, they are not the Gaeltach nor the Northern Isles, um, and there's clearly a, a lack of geography um, and um, perhaps something to do with postcodes there. There are aspects better than three years ago, but of course it's starting from a very poor threshold, and as the report says, it's a problem that is getting more pronounced. Almost 50% of retailers surcharging in uh, 2012, that's now down to 44%. Islands is ever disproportionately impacted, 62% of retailers surcharging, now down to 53%. Um, whilst the percentage is down, customers are paying more, and despite average delivery charges remaining static and falling in real terms, and Highlands and Islands customers pay roughly four times as much for delivery. Um, Overall, um, it's slightly better, but uh, disappointing. The re report states uh, something that we'd all know, and that is that the UK online shopping market is one of the most developed in the world, uh, and it's responsible for 15% of retail sales. Um, and why is that important? It's important because it's a market which gives the same level of choice of goods as centres of population to people living in remote and rural areas. Um, and often um, they're excluded from a range of delivery options and face higher delivery charges uh, to such an extent that that can make online shopping uneconomical. Now, there's many challenges faced by rural living, and research referred to in the report indicates that rural households need to be 10% to 40% higher in order to, uh, budgets need to be higher in order to achieve acceptable living standard. And legislative compliance is important, um, more so against this punitive background. Over a third of the sites, uh, internet sites, stated that the customers had less than their statutory notice to return items, um, and some retailers failed to update terms and conditions to include the consumer contracts regulations. So we do require robust enforcement as well. Members will perhaps be aware of the statement of principles of parcels delivery. It's a, a grand title and it should have had a positive effect. It came into place in 2014. However, only four, a shocking four of the 449 businesses surveyed knew of it. And that's simply not good enough. And the challenge isn't simply for domestic customers. We want to encourage everyone to use their local businesses. And they too face delivery problems with additional um, charges passed on. And, and C uh, Citizens Advice Scotland not only highlight Problems very helpfully, they, they suggest some sol solutions, and in the limited time I have, I'll focus on some of these that hopefully the Minister is able to respond to. Um, firstly, they the recommends the Scottish Government gives consideration to extending road equivalent tariff fare structure to cover vehicles over six metres in length in order to help the reduce the cost of delivery of goods to islands. And I appreciate the complexity around that. Um, um, but as we heard from the report, and I quote, I'm as cheap to buy a ferry ticket and drive as RAT is cheaper than using a carrier, and that's from a Western Isles business owner. So there are opportunities here, and the opportunities are focused around the issue of the final mile consolidation, as it's referred to there. Yes, indeed. 
MacArthur. I am very grateful to, to John Finney for taking intervention. His, his reference to uh, road equivalent tariff, it won't surprise him that those of us who represent islands that aren't benefiting from the road equivalent tariff uh, would certainly argue very strongly for that extension so that precisely the, the point he's making, it would benefit the smaller businesses in Orkney and in Shetland. Would he agree? Well, Mr. absolutely. Finney. As uh, similarly representing the Orkney Islands, yes, that's why I said I appreciate the complexity, and the complexity invariably does relate to the financial implications of it. But I think there's, there's opportunities connected with the final mile consolidation, um, and we do know from the report and the research that islands are more willing to engage in derivative solutions, as we said. And that could be collection from the local post office, and there's a potential knock-on effect for that about adding to sustainability and delivery to ferry. Uh, the collection from the island ferry port services. And of course, we are in the unique position of having CalMAC, and I hope um, these are things that the Minister uh, can uh, take on board. Um, the, the, there, there are always going to be challenges, and the competitiveness of delivery costs and the speed of delivery will be part of that. Um, the report also recommends that the Scottish Government considers how the public sector can work with industry to encourage final mile consolidation in order to reduce delivery costs for Scotland's rural communities. And, and again, it would be very helpful to hear some feedback on that. Um, logistical innovation, indeed, is a term that's there, and there's an opportunity to benefit a range of people. In the short time that's left there, I'll comment on the Royal Mail and the Universal Service obligation and a suggestion there that there's, there's, there's options that could um, be, be used to enhance that, extending that, and new products to be covered by Universal Service obligation. Um, and, and the quote again from the report that says the growing importance of parcel deliveries provides a reason to value and preserve the universal service. And that is because of the downturn, uh, because of changes in, in the use of letters. There's a lot of good work being done by um, Citizens Advice Scotland, including UK-wide collaboration. And that's something that I would commend that the Minister perhaps picks up. There are aspects here which are clearly reserved, but there's an opportunity for the Minister to engage in that. Uh, and, and not least would be extending the definition to cover of universal service obligation to cover um, um, more of the parcels market. So in closing, I, I, I would very much appreciate if the minister could pick up the specific Scottish government elements and confirm that he would be willing to work with the UK government on the other matters. It's an excellent and it's a well-evidenced report and, and I think we all want to support the innovation that's outlined in it. There's an opportunity for retailers, there's an opportunity for customers, and if done right, there's an opportunity for the planet as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Tight for time today. Um, confine people to their four minutes, if I may. Please call on Mike Russell to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I commend uh, and congratulate John Finney for uh, achieving this debate. Presiding Officer, in 2015, when surcharges were applied, rural customers were paying roughly four times as much for delivery as their urban counterparts. Those surcharges have increased about 10% in real terms since 2012, while at the same time, average delivery prices throughout the country have dropped by 6%. Over 50% of retailers surcharge island residents, 44% surcharge Highland customers. 11% of retailers refuse even to deliver to parts of Scottish islands. Now, with online retail becoming increasingly ubiquitous and the decline in physical shopping, that's placing a huge burden on rural cu customers, a huge burden on my constituents in Argyll and Butte. The problems make living in Argyll and Butte more and more difficult. 96.5% of the land in my constituency uh, is remote rural. 17.5% of people live on islands. The constituency is almost entirely affected by these unfair and high surcharges. Royal Mail doesn't surcharge, and the universal service obligation is ever more vital. I remember when I lived in the Western Isles in the 1970s, the post still going the three and a half miles to Renegadale by foot twice a week. That history is an impressive one, and we need to carry that commitment forward and to carry the post forward in the way that helps people in rural areas. Now, surcharges are often based on erroneous information and subjective analysis. My constituent, Christine Roth in Campbellton, has told me that she suffers three times the standard delivery charges often because couriers say she lives on an island. It's been a long time since Campbellton was on an island of its own. So we need to find ways to take this issue forward. 
The first is to revise and improve the universal service obligation to accommodate the increasing use of parcels. We need to increase the type of parcels covered and to broaden the scale of the Royal Mail commitment. And I have to say, presiding officer, with the current SNP presence in Westminster, uh, those members uh, will have a chance to deal with the reserved matter to favour the Highland constituents. The universal service obligation has been a key part of ensuring reasonable prices and delivery to the Highlands for generations. It now needs to be modernised to reflect the reality of life. The new Consumer Rights Act comes into force on October the 1st, and this is the perfect time to educate businesses and consumers and ensure compliance with the minimum standards for delivery services. Earlier in 2015, a quarter of businesses surveyed stated that they deduct delivery costs from returned items. That is not in compliance with the current consumer contract regulations or with the regulations that will be, uh, come in on October the 1st. Some small items carry a rural delivery surcharge of up to £50. If you add in a cost deduction for return, that means some rural customers are stuck with items that are worth less than the carriage. And of course, we have to work with courier services and retailers to simplify delivery services. The last mile consolidation that John Finney referred to is important. Courier services could drop small loads or packages at one place and a single carrier finish the deliveries. Ferry delivery, coordinated, would be very positive, and the Minister has this week made a very useful and helpful intervention in supporting ferries. More could be done to make sure that those ferries become uh, an agent of delivery. And more delivery to local shops and post offices by couriers. Yesterday, my office spoke with Chris Lamb, the manager of the Jura community store. Bulk items and perishables are delivered not to Jura, uh, but to a depot in Isla in order to pick these up. The community does so, and the community is helping itself. That could, help else, that could happen elsewhere. We must do our best to help our own constituents. Presiding officer, in concluding, can I say that I have to go and help two of my young constituents who have just come to the Parliament, so I'm unable to stay. I apologise to other members, but I'm very grateful to John Finney for getting this debate and to the Citizens Advice Bureau for taking things forward. Thanks very much. Now I call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start where uh, Mike Russell finished and offer my own apologies to you uh, and to the Minister and all members uh, for the fact that I will have to leave the debate before the end. Uh, but I too congratulate John Finney on the motion and on securing the debate. I think it allows us an opportunity um, to acknowledge the work done by CAS more generally, but, 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 but bureaus across the country. I certainly know in my own Orkney constituency that the, the CAB is a vital local partner that helps me uh, to serve my constituents better, and I would want to put that on record from the start. But also, um, I think there's a wider campaigning role uh, that CAST performs, and not least in this issue of unfair surcharges. I recall actually lodging a very similar uh, motion to the one John Finney has lodged uh, in, uh, to coincide with an earlier report on this issue. I think the information it provides is fascinating. It provides a detailed study based on widespread, uh, widespread uh, research. It paints a picture of the situation facing my constituents and those from across the Highlands and Islands, about the impact on individuals, but also crucially on local businesses, a point John Finney uh, made very well, highlighting the surcharges and indeed those instances where people are failing uh, to get their products uh, at all. The reports also allow us, I think, to track the situation over time. And this latest report, again, makes for interesting reading. Uh, it would suggest that since 2012, fewer online re retailers surcharge but those that do are actually charging more than they were uh, three years ago. The, the hike in charges are around 16 17% against uh, a falling trend uh, in, the, uh, in the rest of the UK generally. Uh, there are fewer that are refusing to deliver at all, although that still does uh, happen. Uh, and this rather bears out my own uh, experience. I think very often uh, when approached by constituents, if you contact the companies, many are willing to, to look again at the pra practices, uh, whether to reduce or, or, or remove the additional charges. Uh, or at the very least offer clearer advice to those who are uh, purchasing uh, online. But as the Royal Mail confirm in their briefing, parcels up to 30 kilograms are available through our universal service of first and second class post to all our country, uh, customers, no matter where they live. So the option is there, and it's not an option of which those online retailers who are surcharging are entirely ignorant. I was contacted recently by a constituent in Stronzi, uh, unlike Campbelltown, an actual island. Um, the constituent had ordered a product online. He was told there was a surcharge of £5.99 and an extra surcharge of £7.99 as he lived on an island. 
As he needed the parts desperately for his own work, he went ahead and ordered them. When they arrived, they arrived by Royal Mail in a postage paid envelope, making a mockery of the need for a surcharge at all. Deputy President Officer, this demonstrates, I think, that more still needs to be done to address the postcode lottery, despite the introduction of a code of practice by the previous coalition government. And I, I think I note the, the concerns that John Finney raised in that regard. I'd certainly be interested to know um, whether the Minister feels there's more the Scottish Government can do in applying pressure uh, it, itself. And I thank Citizens Vice, Vice Scotland for their efforts in continuing to shine a light on these practices. I think some of the progress we've seen in this latest report, uh, they can claim uh, justifiably a fair degree of credit for. I look forward to continuing to work with them and with colleagues across this chamber to achieve further progress. And I thank John Finney again on securing the debate, allowing Parliament to lend its collective voice to calls for a fair deal for customers and businesses in Orkney and across the Highlands and Islands. And once again, can I conclude by apologising for having to leave the debate early? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now call on Dave Thompson to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to congratulate John Finney on securing uh, this debate, a very important debate. Uh, especially in relation to my uh, own constituency of Skylach Harbour and Badenoch. Um, the, the, the motion that John Finney put down mentions uh, trading standards services, and uh, I spent most of my professional career as a trading standards officer, finishing with Highland Council a number of years ago as director of protective services, and we looked at these kind of issues quite a bit. One of the major problems, of course, was a lack of powers, to actually do uh, a lot about this. Um, I would also, I think, at this stage declare an interest because I'm still involved with the Chartered Trading Standards Institute as a, a vice president of that institute in the, in the UK. Now, high surcharges are nothing new. Um, the report clearly shows as well, it's not just high surcharges, of course, it's late delivery, or people being excluded altogether uh, from supply of goods. And this doesn't just apply, uh, presiding officer, to consumers, it applies to businesses as well. And it can be particularly damaging for small businesses, uh, both in relation to uh, receiving goods that they need to, for their businesses, but also in getting their goods away out of the areas as well. Now, when you look, when I look back, uh, I too, as Mike Russell uh, did, lived in the Western Isles. I lived there from 1973 to 1983. And there wasn't an awful lot of shopping choice in the Western Isles at that time. So the great lifesaver was the catalogue. And the company that seems to stick in my mind was J.D. Williams. And it was a fantastic shopping experience. You didn't get dragged round shops by your wife uh, for hours on end and then back to the original one to buy an item. You just flicked through a catalogue. You did that in the comfort of your sitting room. Uh, and not only that, we didn't have much money um, uh, in these days and you could pay it up over 40 weeks or more. I remember at one point we needed a new bed. We bought our bed from the catalogue, and we paid it up. That bed was delivered to Stornoway from somewhere down in England, the J.D. Williams uh, main depot, free of charge. There was no additional cost. Anybody who ordered that bed any, anywhere in the UK got it delivered. So this thing appeared at our door, um, you know, just at the same cost. Yes, certainly. Christine I like the Graham, sound of this J.D. Williams. The Are they still trading? I, I, I thank the member for her intervention. I, I think they were taken over a time ago, but uh, the principles upon which they operated are principles we should still be working on in terms of these companies, but unfortunately, they, they aren't. Um, if I could move on very quickly, um, presiding Last 40 officer. Seconds. The, um, the Royal Mail, I want to deal with that, but I want to touch on trading standards. There's been a real problem with trading standards departments in the recent years, insofar as their numbers have been decimated. There are a number of reports now from BIS, 
Uh, there are reports being worked on by COSLA and the Scottish Government at this moment. And we need to strengthen the Trading Standards Service if we're going to be able to tackle some of these issues. As far as the Royal Mail is concerned, and I'll conclude in this point, Presiding Officer, we really need a public sector Royal Mail and we need to increase the maximum from 30 kilograms to 100 kilograms. That would deal at a stroke with delivery of goods right up to 100 kilograms, 220 pounds to anywhere in the country. Any decent, sensible government would do this. Unfortunately, our present UK government is going in the opposite direction. Many thanks. Now call on Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you very much. I too congratulate John Finney on securing today's debate. The postcode penalty, as he has said, affects people across the Highlands and Islands, but it also has impacts on consumers right across the north of Scotland. Indeed, the definitions of Highlands and Islands used by parcel delivery companies not only include thousands of people who live and work in the rural northeast, people whom I represent, it also impacts on the Aberdeen travel to work area. So people who live uh, in the northeast and who work and travel in and out of the city of Aberdeen every day can find themselves caught by these discriminatory charges. Aberdeen may have more direct connections by plane and train to London every day than many comparable cities and generate more GDP than any other city of its size anywhere in Britain. But to many of these companies, it is clearly a far-flung outpost on the way to the Arctic Circle, or perhaps just an opportunity to make more money from discriminatory charging. And indeed, their idea of delivery to Scotland's islands seems to come from watching too often the black and white version of Whiskey Galore, and to be entirely uninformed by the existence of bridges or causeways or lifeline ferry services. The authors of this report call on the UK Government to use the new Consumer Rights Act to educate business and customers about rights and obligation and, uh, and to look at revising the universal service obligation. Those recommendations are welcome, but they do not go far enough. We cannot rely on the present Conservative Government to be on the right side of this argument. Business Minister Nick Bowles addressed a debate at Westminster the other day and rejected calls for legislation offering instead a roundtable event involving online retailers and government ministers. It is hard to see how a cosy chat with ministers will make any difference to the worldview of retailers or service providers who have not bothered to sort this problem out for themselves. What I think is required instead is to make the customer king. If retailers cannot be trusted to be honest and upfront about delivery costs or to explain clearly where surcharges apply, then give customers the right to know. A statutory right for customers ordering online to choose their delivery service provider would allow people in remote and rural areas to choose Royal Mail and therefore force Royal Mail's competitors to match their quality of service to customers rather than simply to undercut their costs to suppliers. Royal Mail delivers parcels everywhere in the United Kingdom with no surcharge whatsoever. Despite the folly of privatisation, it continues to take pride in delivering its universal service obligation six days a week to every inhabited island and to every remote neighbourhood in the country. Other suppliers could be forced to do the same. That could mean either giving customers the right to choose or alternatively only permitting parcel delivery by providers who adopt the universal service obligation in full. If privatisation is bound to hit rural areas hardest, the prospect of the contracting out of lifeline ferry services to the Hebrides and the Clyde Islands will fill islanders with concern. Our view is that the Scottish Government should instead keep those services in public hands. Not at the moment. I'm sure the Minister will respond to that. But if they will not do that, and the Tories will not intervene on parcel delivery surges, surcharges, then Scottish Ministers should certainly use the powers that they do have in this field. The road equivalent tariff, as John Finney said, could be extended to cover larger vehicles, creating savings for retailers, which could and should be passed to consumers, and removing one poor excuse that the retailers have for their discriminatory behaviour. Warm words on this subject are not enough from anybody. Government here and at Westminster needs to take this issue seriously and to accept that privatising efficient public services will never be in the public interest. Thank you very much. Now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Mary Scanlon.
Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I, I shall keep to the topic on debate, and I commend John Finney on securing this debate and recognise the impact of delivery charges is undoubtedly greater in the Highlands and Islands, as we have seen by the representative speaking here. And I also congratulate Con Consumer Scotland, because uh, 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 Consultants Advice Scotland, I beg your pardon, who now do consumer issues, because they have sub substantial use, not just to the general public, but to people and members like myself in this chamber. However, the issue of what is excessive delivery charges can also apply, believe it or not, in my Borders constituency. I received an email from Valerie Bannerman from Walkerburn, who placed an order with Abbey Couriers in England, and having been advised of the delivery charges at £65, was astonished to discover she was being charged almost double that amount when the goods arrived. Where it, it, the price for England and Wales, the standard rate is £80. For Scotland, it's £150. And indeed, it's even more if you're marked up to a remote area, all based on postcode. In fairness, the rates are on the website, but having been told the rates, she checked no further. But that said, this means that if you are, say, one mile over the border in Berwick, it's £80, and the Berwick is one mile over the border, and half a mile over the border in Scotland on the A1, and there are cottages there, and it's a trunk road, the A1, it's £150, no ifs, no buts. In the email from the constituent, she was told that she'd been misinformed that £65 was the UK price. When she pointed out that Scotland is part of the UK, she was then told that £65 was for England and Wales only. This was, she informed, because crossing the border, mileage and fuel charges, and that she was fortunate that 120 she was eventually charged was the trade price and she should be paying the 150. There can be very much mileage in half a mile in very little fuel that does it that. So there are injustices way down on the border which you wouldn't expect. I took the matter up with the firm They've not replied. I wrote to them in July, so I'm going to name them in this chamber and I'm going to send them a copy of this report. Maybe then they'll bother to reply and advise Citizens Advice Scotland of this. So, Abbey Couriers of Ledbury, Hertfordshire, you're named in shame because you've not taken the trouble over all those months to reply and to explain to me why, if you're only half a mile over the border, you're paying another £80. I notice they say on their website, we are big enough to provide a national service and small enough to provide a personal caring service to every single customer, close quotes. Well, not if you're in Scotland when it's double the price. I will also touch on the Royal Mail. Privatised in 2013, sold off at bargain basement prices. On the first day of trading in October 2013, the prices leapt up by 38%, rising to a peak of 615 pence. Of course, many of the large investors immediately sold them off, having made big bucks. One, million, one billion was lost to us, the original shareholders of the Royal Mail. And there's a difficulty here because the guarantee of a universal service is only protected till 2021. Now, if I'm around then, God willing, let's just see if there's still a universal delivery service with the Royal Mail. All of this gives concern, not just because of my constituent Valerie Bannerman and others uh, across the Scottish borders, but again, as others have said, many people in rural areas rely on these deliveries to maintain their businesses and to send their products out. And they are being surcharged unfairly. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now I call on Mary Scanlon to be followed by Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I was listening to Dave Thompson and he actually sounded very posh uh, when he talked about getting a catalogue. Uh, when I was growing up in Angus, uh, uh, it was known as the clubby book, and uh, I think that was possibly the, the word, but the catalogue certainly sounds uh, amazing. I would also like to thank John Finney for bringing this issue to the debating chamber. And I'd like to thank Citizens Advice Scotland uh, for providing us with an update on the postcode penalty. As a former volunteer for Citizens Advice, I always highly value and respect the work they do, not only on a wide range of issues, but on behalf of people all across Scotland. 
Uh, as John Finney said, the UK online shopping market is one of the most developed in the whole world, with sales now contributing up to 15% of total retail sales and consumers benefiting with the same level of choice that's enjoyed closer to the population centres. I think we should also look at some of the good news that's in the report. Of course, things could be better, but I think this could be as a result of the ongoing interest and awareness with citizens', citizens advice. Retailers uh, now adding the surcharge compared to uh, three years ago, uh, the number has dropped. The proportion of retailers surcharging consumers to the islands, as John Finney said, in the islands it's dropped by 11%, in the highlands 5%. A step in the right direction, still more to do. And I think it's worth commending the Royal Mail here, I think they deserve a mention, with parcels up to 30 kilograms delivered through the universal service of first and second class to all consumers, no matter where they live, and six uh, days of the week. But it is disappointing where the surcharge exists that that has also risen. It's also good news that fewer retailers now refuse to deliver to remote areas compared to 2012, a fall of, 20, uh, a fall of uh, 7%. But there's no doubt, as others have said, of the additional costs, not just to consumers, but to doing business in, uh, across Scotland. But as John Finney mentioned, uh, the recommendations to the delivery operators were very constructive, and I think that much more can be done by looking at a range of options, including collection from the post office, collection from the local shop, other safe places. And I would hope also that the ferry terminals could be used as a pick-up point where appropriate, because this could potentially reduce the road miles quite, and the cost quite significantly. I was concerned to read about um, how businesses cope with these surcharges. 20% of businesses state that they absorb remote delivery surcharges and 3% spread these surcharges across all customers. However, the worrying figure is 24% pass on the surcharge in full to customers, which is a massive increase in the cost of living and the cost of doing business in remote and rural areas. And I thought Mike Russell made a very good point. We're talking about delivery today. But it's not just the delivery. If you don't like what's been sent to you, the cost of returning it is absolutely prohibitive. And I know I've done it myself from Inverness. And the cost on the parcel from Amazon was something like five pounds. But that's their agreement with the post office. The cost for the consumer to send it back is about 40 pounds. So I think that's worth illustrating. And as Mike Russell said, people are often left with uh, goods that they don't want. So finally, presiding officer, uh, I, I, my recommendation is to name and shame those retailers, retailers with the highest surcharge. I'm quite sure the Stornoway Gazette, Shetland Times, Arcadian and Highland news, newspapers wouldn't mind publishing the names please. of those with the high surcharge and also those who do not surcharge. So I thank John Finney once again. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Kenny Gibson, to which we'll move the closing speech to the Minister. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to add my congratulations to John Finney on securing this valuable debating time. Uh, this growing online market is of particular importance, as we've heard, to rural, remote rural and island communities. However, as we've also heard, rural and island consumers are often excluded from home delivery options or face high delivery surcharges that can make online shopping very expensive. And it's not acceptable that many constituents are inhibited in their online shopping options because they live in a particular area. In 2012, when uh, uh, CES published a full report on the postcode penalty, it was found that 6,400 of my Cunningham North constituents were affected by discriminatory charging. Additional delivery charges are a major issue for 15,000 businesses in remote, rural and island Scotland, and this obviously puts them at a competitive disadvantage. And as we know, the additional delivery charges impact the Highlands and Islands, which include Arne and Cumbria in my constituency, more than other rural areas. 
When a surcharge is added, Highland and Island consumers pay approximately four times as much for delivery as mainland consumers. For example, one consumer purchased an item that cost £1.15. The total charge came to £51.14, meaning a delivery charge of £49.99 was imposed, an absurd amount to pay for an item worth 2.3% of the delivery charge. Surcharges for Highland consumers have risen by a whopping 17.6%, and by 15.8% for island consumers since 2012. And I know that the low profile of the statement of principles on parcel deliveries will come as a, a disappointment to the Minister, who has already worked very hard in this area, as indeed has his colleague uh, Fergus Ewing. There is a clear issue of communication here between businesses and the Scottish Government. And whilst it is frustrating that the Scottish Parliament does not have more powers uh, over mail delivery, as Dave Thompson has pointed out, more has to be done to raise awareness about the statement of principles on parcel deliveries. Delivery charges can be a major challenge, not just for consumers in rural and island areas, but small businesses as, as well. And of course, John Finney uh, and Mike Russell, uh, uh, Mary Scanlon and others have suggested a number of potential solutions, for example, such as mail collections at ferry terminals, where online retailers uh, can consider uh, changes which would benefit uh, their own consumers. And of course, businesses themselves in rural areas have less choice when it comes to choosing a delivery operator and are more likely to rely on Royal Mail. Uh, and colleagues have, have been almost unanimous in, in, in uh, talking about how Royal Mail doesn't surcharge the Highlands and Islands of Scotland as the only provider of the universal service obligation in the UK with parcels up to 30 kilograms available through the obligation of first and second class post to all customers, uh, no matter where they live six days a week. And it's unfortunate that more online retailers do not use Royal Mail. Moreover, for online shopping to be an enjoyable experience for the consumer, an intricate set of business relationships and economic structures must be maintained by the retailer, the delivery operator, and often a separate supplier of goods. And, and, and some of the problems can develop early on in the ordering process. For example, um, when one orders online, uh, the design of the retailer's website can be crucial for the customer's experience of home delivery. For example, some websites fail to mention early on in the process that delivery costs or promotions do not apply to them because of their postcode, meaning consumers waste time and the retailer loses out on business. Citizens Advice Scotland recommends the Scottish Government considers how the wider public sector can work with industry to encourage final mail consolidation in order to reduce delivery costs for Scottish rural and island consumers. To conclude, I thank again John Finney for bringing this debate to, to the Chamber and trust that the Scottish Government will continue to engage with their Westminster counterparts to ensure improvements are made to assist the postal services in rural and island Scotland. Many thanks. I call the Minister Derek Mackay to conclude the debate on behalf of the Government. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Okay, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I congratulate also uh, John Finney on securing this debate. My colleague Fergus Ewing, Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism, has taken a close interest in this issue for many years. He's disappointed he can't be here. He, of course, would take the lead in this issue, but I have a clear interest as Islands Minister and with the transport issues. Uh, also, indeed, over the, the summer, I visited a number of islands and heard a number of the challenges that they face for island uh, living. And this, of course, uh, is one. There are actions government, Scottish government can take take, actions that UK government can also take. And I did agree with quite a lot of what Lewis MacDonald had said, but, but not everything. Your unnecessary ill-informed scaremongering around the ferry contract was most unhelpful and accurate. Uh, well, you know, I, you reap as you sow, and I shouldn't take an intervention, but I am such a kind character. Of course I'll take an intervention for Mr MacDonald. Well, I, I'm Mr. glad to have uh, allowed the Minister to rediscover his generous side and uh, I, I appreciate very much uh, that he's taken my intervention. Will he recognise whatever his view of the uh, process that he is about to undertake in relation to Calmac, that the point I made that people in the islands are very anxious about the prospect of a private company taking over a successful public service, uh, that is an absolutely real point. It's not something I've made up. It's something that people in the islands will have told him if he was listening. 
Minister. Well, well, I have been listening very closely to what islanders have been saying around ferry services, and frankly, a lot of the anxiety is actually caused by the Labour Party perpetrating untruths about um, the current process. You also said that we should just simply keep it uh, within the current uh, framework. You know to do that would be in breach of European uh, regulations, and would put, itself would put the uh, ferry services into some doubt as we would be in conflict of regulations and all sorts of challenges. So we'll comply with the law and get the best possible deal. So I'll now do the reassurance bit for all uh, islanders. That is that the Scottish Government, whatever the outcome of the procurement exercise for the CHIS contract, the timetables uh, will be set by government, the vessels will continue to be owned by the public sector, the fares will be set by the Scottish Government through the operator. But there is one challenge for all potential operators in this. That is actually how they can look at the needs uh, of island communities and consider how they would commit to some of the suggestions that have been made in this chamber this afternoon around uh, how they could further use the infrastructure, the hubs, the, the transport connections to, to, to further support on the transport side. So there is an opportunity here, but uh, there is no risk uh, to services as suggested by Lewis MacDonald. I was particularly interested, though, in the legislative aspect of being able to choose the provider, i.e. Royal Mail. I think that is a very helpful uh, suggestion. And no matter what we can do as a Scottish Government, I think no matter how much we do in terms of ferries or routes or timetables or hubs or anything else, if it was dealt with through legislation to ensure people's rights, I think that it would address a number of the other issues that would be somewhat more difficult to address through perceptions or other interventions. So I commend Citizens Advice Scotland for drawing our attention to this issue, for their work, their case studies and the evidence that they've produced. I can assure all members that will inform a forward transport policy and island policy uh, as well as the, the, the business agenda as well. On that uh, theme, Fergus Ewing chaired the parcel delivery summits in 2012 and 2013, which did lead to the statement of principles, which I fully understand it haven't been totally adopted by many as we would like them to be again if that was placed on a statutory footing. It could only be done in Westminster, not here, uh, but we would absolutely uh, welcome progress on that. I saw the comment from Minister Nick Bowles that he doesn't want to go uh, to, to primary uh, legislation or necessarily regulation, but that might be the best place to go. I also understand he visited Collinsey on his summer holidays as well. I was also in Collinsey, not at the same time, uh, but I know he's heard from uh, 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 islanders on their specific needs. And I raise that as an example because one of the interventions I've been able to make as Transport Minister is to now consult on improved timetables. Why does that help? because it might allow a better turnaround for deliveries to and from the islands, making it easier for couriers and others eh, to be able to get the products on and off the island, or the vehicles as well, because sometimes it's the vehicles eh, being stuck on the island that's part of the issue. Everyone's aware of the... Uh, of course... Finney? Uh, I'm grateful for the Minister accepting an intervention. There, of course, there are, there are mechanisms short of actually putting more vehicles on the islands that, that might be more beneficial. And when you have the competitive market, that might be challenging. So uh, the challenge to, from me to you is, would you do a facilitating role to look at all these options, please? Minister? Yes, I'm happy to get Transport Scotland to look at the suggestions around transport hubs, collection hubs, all those points. So I think that's a helpful suggestion. Yes, I will commit to my uh, officials undertaking uh, that work in partnership with other stakeholders and through community planning as well, focusing on a sense of place and what more uh, transport can do to help with every aspect uh, of island living as a point uh, well um, made. So I'll commit to that and also to listening to the comments of the uh, rural parliament and the rural network as well, recognising, as other members have said, it's not just an island issue, but it's um, a, an island issue um, uh, a, a, as well. And there will also be further work. Yes, all mainland issues, uh, Christine, including the borders, and work with Citizens Advice Scotland and Highlands and Islands Enterprise to look at a, a range of models that may be deployed and then replicated across um, the country, specifically on ferry services. There's a record amount of uh, funding in ferry services, lifeline ferry services, and uh, in this financial year, over £145 million committed to support those lifeline uh, services. We have expanded road equivalent tariff. The completion for the Clyde and Hebrides network uh, will be uh, next month. And in terms specifically around RET 
there was evidence at the time when commercial benefits or commercial eligibility was there that that reduction wasn't passed on to the customer and that has to be assured before you could even consider uh, going there. But what we were able to do in 2012 was to allow commercial vehicles under six metres in length to qualify for RET. So that does mean that the post vans or smaller courier vehicles do actually get the RET discount, which of course is cheaper than the outstanding at commercial fares, but it is about affordability, ensuring that those intended to benefit actually benefit. And that's why I'm also looking in this final few seconds at the current freight policy as well, which I'll report on uh, later this year. But that's what the Scottish Government's doing. So a range of transport actions, and I would call again, as others have done, on UK government to take action from the, as Lewis MacDonald called it, cosy chat with minister, but who knows, maybe it will lead to further reg uh, regulation and legislation, but the principle should apply so that we can have better universality uh, of charges, not to discriminate against areas of peripherality, rurality or island living. And I call again on UK government to act in that spirit. Many thanks, and many thanks to you all for taking part in this important debate. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30. <laughs>